what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. I don't claim to know the mind of the people who designed the lectionary, so I, I don't, for the life of me, quite understand why we stopped at the first half of verse 25. But for purposes of this sermon, it's probably important that you know the rest of it. So Paul is, is saying, who will rescue me from this body of death? He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he goes on to say, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And this duality, this, this war that we wage with ourselves is really my topic this morning. Now, this is the third in a trilogy of a ser sermons on Romans, and it's a trilogy because I go on vacation later this afternoon. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so let me just recap. So two weeks ago, we talked about how the, the, differ the difference between inheriting the kingdom of God and participating in the saving purposes of God. And then last week, we looked at how participating in the saving purposes of God is rather like slavery to Jesus. And we looked at how there are actually two kinds of slavery. There's the kind of slavery that makes you captive, and there's the kind of slavery that sets you free. And you recall the illustration there for the part that makes us captive. An easy place to look would be addiction, where one's whole life begins to be taken over, and you become a slave to the drug, to getting the drug and taking the drug. But then we also looked at how there's another kind of slavery <clears throat> that actually can set you free. And we, we looked at how a musician, someone who becomes a slave to music or to an instrument, becomes truly free to play the instrument. And you can always spot someone who's a slave to an instrument because they can really play. They're truly free to play that music in any way they want and can, can expand all kinds of styles of music because they're so devoted to that instrument. And being a slave to Jesus is, is like that. When we give ourselves over to him, we find that yes, this life is truly freeing. Now, having said all of that, now Paul turns his attention to the dilemma that most Christians figure out rather quickly that although we have this new life, although we've been given the life of the Spirit, we are born again, sin still has its claws in us. Sin still rears its head in our lives. And so the problem I think this produces is we can enter into a cycle of guilt where we try, to, we try hard to be Christian. We try hard to participate in the saving works of God. We try to be faithful to Christ's body, the church. But no matter how hard I try, sin still rears its ugly head. And if that cycle of guilt continues, tragically what can happen is people will give up. A couple different ways that that might happen. One, one way, a person might give up by saying, well, I'm going to sin anyway, so the heck with it. I'm just going to let grace abound and just sin. Forget all this stuff. I think the, the one that I see more often, though, is people who walk away. They just walk away from the church. Christians still struggle in life. Tragedy still strikes. Christians can feel punished sometimes when things go wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm your servant, Lord. I've given my life to you. Why is this happening? And they walk away as a result. So somehow we have to sort of get on a foundation where we understand the reality of the Christian life and then begin to apply the principles. So Let's think about what we can take away from what Paul's trying to tell us. And it's actually pretty straightforward. 
it's just hard to put into practice. We need to come to terms with the fact that there is a war. You have a sin nature, and you have a spirit nature. If you're in Christ, if you're baptized, you have the spirit is living in you, you're born again, you have this spirit nature, and the two are at war with one another. The more we can come to terms with that, then I think the third thing to take away is that we need to just get on with it, get out of this cycle of guilt, and get on with participating in God's saving work. So let's think about that. So the sin nature. We have this sin nature. I talked a little bit about this a couple weeks ago when I described how every time I move to a new location, I find myself in a new place, but feeling out of place. Like I'm still connected to where I was, even though I'm in a new place. So let me, let me describe this in another way. So many years ago, Carolyn and I were on a trip to Cleveland. We were visiting some friends, and I took her to my childhood home, and then to the church where I grew up. And I, you know, a lot of you, you've grown up in Fitchburg, you've grown up in this area, you've spent your whole life here, and that's just not, that's not true for me. After I graduated from college, I, I never went back to Mentor, Ohio. So I'm driving in the car, pulling up the street where I grew up, and then I see my house, and all of these emotions just came flooding out of me that I just didn't know were there. And then I had the same experience when I walked into my church, St. Andrews in Mentor, Ohio, and I was kind of dumbstruck by how vivid the emotions were. They never left me. They were always there. Now that's the positive way of describing what Paul is writing about negatively, that sin is there. Your sin nature is still there. Even though you've been born again, the fact remains sin nature is still there. It will still re rear its ugly head. But this is where we need to really think about our new nature, our life in the spirit. And what the life in the Spirit does is it, does, it doesn't eliminate sin, it doesn't make life easy in a piece of cake, but it eliminates the effects of sin. You are no longer in bondage to sin. It no longer has a claim on you. The effects, for example, death, no longer apply for those who are in Christ Jesus. As Paul puts it, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Paul writes about this in several of his letters, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, it's even hinted at in the first chapter of John. The effects of sin have been nullified, they've been abolished. Paul puts his, turns his focus on this more fully in chapter 8, and I have to peek, we have to peek into it to make the point. In chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, I know you're going to recognize this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus the Messiah. For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Life isn't going to be easy. Being a Christian isn't a piece of cake. But the effects of sin have been nullified. You are forgiven. Let's get on with it. That's the, the last point. Get on with it. Participate in the saving purposes of God. Become a slave to Jesus, to borrow that language from last week. And I have in your handout here ch from cha chapter 6, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. Christians, for whatever reason, often struggle with this reality, that these, these two things are true about us. We have this sin nature and we have this spirit nature, and life isn't always going to be a piece of cake. And the fact is, is that, again, to borrow from the language of Romans, you have been moved from your Adam, humanity, death nature into a new place, You've been saved by virtue of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. You now have the life of the Spirit in you. Therefore, 
get on with it and start living the life that corresponds with this new salvation. It isn't automatic. I've hinted at N.T. Wright throughout this, this trilogy, and let me just hint one more time. N.T. Wright has written a trilogy. It's, they're not sold as a trilogy, but they are. The first one is Simply Christian. And by the way, I think N.T. Wright is our modern day C.S. Lewis, and Simply Christian is his version of mere Christianity, if you've written, read, read that. So Simply Christian, Surprised by Hope, in which he talks about that our Christian hope is in fact something that has broken into this world, into the, the life that we live right now is the life of the kingdom of God. But then the third book that no one pays attention to is called After You Believe. And it's arguably the more important of the three. And I think one of the reasons why it doesn't get any fanfare is because that's the book about how all the work that goes along with being a Christian. That it doesn't just happen. You, you're in this new place, so now we've got to learn to live uh, a new way. It's like, again, to borrow the language of moving. Every time I move to a new place, there's a whole new culture. And understanding it doesn't happen automatically. So, you know, I'm a Midwesterner for the most part. I come to New England and, you know, there's a whole culture here. And it goes way beyond the fact that y'all cut your hot dogs on the top rather than on the side like they're supposed to be. <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or, you know, when to drop the R's and add the R's. I've never quite figured that out. But you understand what I'm saying is that everywhere you go, there, there's a culture that you have to learn because it's, you're in a new place. So you have a sin nature, you have a spirit nature. That's the reality. The spirit nature cancels out the effects of the sin nature. So let's get on with it. Now, how can we do that? How can you begin to just get on with it? So quickly, the way forward. I think one thing is confess your confusion. If you're like me, you're going to have to say to God, and I've been to seminary, okay? I said to God, God, this is crazy sometimes. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Just let him know. I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers. Just admit this to God. You don't have victory over every sin. You don't, I don't, and Paul didn't. Secondly, accept imperfections, your own and others. Accept the imperfections. I know nothing good lives in me, he wrote. We need to learn to accept that truth, that we are imperfect. And God knows we need to start accepting the imperfections in others. And whatever you do, exercise some restraint before labeling the imperfections of others. I love and accept you, you Democrat. or evangelical. You know, that word gets thrown around like it's a swear word sometimes. It's how I feel sometimes. I'm like, hey, wait a minute, hold on. I'm an evangelical. All right, just, just exercise some restraint. We need to learn to accept our own imperfections and the imperfections of others. And the next two, I think, are even more important. The, first, the, the third point here is be prepared to fail. Don't be surprised when you fail. It's going to happen. I could truthfully and accurately describe my ministry as a ministry of mistakes. To the extent that I do anything well for God, it's because I didn't do it well the hundred times before that. Right? Why don't we have testimonies of failure in the church? We, we probably should. We probably need to get up every now and then and say, you know, this is where I fell flat on my face. And I just didn't do it. Because that's life. That's the reality. Fourth, be honest with God. Let me clue you in on a secret. You cannot shock God. There isn't anything that you can say to him 
in which he's going to go, oh, I can't believe you said that. You cannot shock God. Be honest with him. Are you angry with him? Let him have it. He can take it. I mean, that's what, that's what being in a relationship with Jesus is all about, I think. I think the people in relationship, if the relationship is good and healthy, well, that's what happens. You tell the person you love, this is how I feel. This is how I feel. So do that with God. And last but not least, do not depend on rules. It's very tempting in this battle that we are in, in this cycle that we get in, to say, okay, let's create rules. Maybe that way I'll stop the sinning. My, my youngest son, Nick, when he was in Paducah, he's in the Coast Guard, remember, when he was in Paducah, he was in a Bible study uh, from his church. It was led by a lay person. And he, this was one of these guys, and you, maybe you've met someone like this, who had all the answers, who knew everything, apparently, and had in his mind a framework of Christian morality and ethics. And you're either in it or you're not. Everything is black and white. And the more I listened to Nick describe this person, the more I realized that the guy's own moral code was condemning him. Which, by the way, is exactly what Paul is writing about in Romans. That's what happens. Rules save no one. Rules save no one. I'm not saying that rules don't matter. Do they matter? Sure. Do we need them? Yes. But the moment you start turning to rules, that's when the relationship's already failed. Right? The law of monogamy in marriage doesn't make a marriage good. I mean, can you, can you imagine? I love my wife. We have a great marriage. Thank God for the law of monogamy. It saved my marriage more than once. I mean, seriously, when you love someone, you don't need the rule, right? Once you need, have a need to point to the rule, it's because it's already been broken. Rules save no one. And again, that's also one of Paul's points here in Romans. So the truth is, the life of the age to come has begun but we still call it the age to come. The kingdom of God has arrived in the person of Jesus Christ, and yet we still pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Together, let's come to terms with this and recognize that this is life in this world, and it will continue until Jesus comes again and remakes heaven and earth. And until then, together, let's get on with it. Amen.